It's my pleasure to be here and it's my task after lunchtime to entertain you now for the next 40 minutes. And although I'm a technical person, I try to do that without any equation and things like this. So you will see a lot of videos and thoughts that I have, developments that we have done, you know, how we can use digital technologies, especially robotics, sensor data interpretation, photogrammetry areas where I'm working on, towards um, sustainable crop production. So why you should, should you care about this? Why this is at all relevant? And this is a slide that Tony knows from a few years back. I still keep it in the beginning of my presentation because it's a pretty good start for motivation. If we look to the amount of biomass that we have been producing from the beginning of mankind until 2010, that's approximately the same amount that is needed from the time spent 2010 to 2050, so within 40 years. And the additional challenge that comes with this, we need to do this in a sustainable manner so that the next generations are also able to produce the biomass that they actually need. So why do we need so much? We need so much, we have a large number of people on our planet, but we're also using crops differently. So we use um, crops in order to drive with our cars to some degree. Biofuel takes away a lot of things. We change our eating habits. So if you look to the increase or expected increase in meat, consumption is quite a lot, and if you compare the calories that we uh, consume if we eat crops or if we eat a cow that ate the crop before, the ratio is actually pretty bad for the cow, so it's better to have fast to eat crops. But that's what's happening, it's hard to prevent that, so we are expecting to have a substantially higher demand in biomass that, need to be that needs to be produced. At the same point in time, this production comes at negative impacts on our ecosystems. So this is an example from a study looking into the amount of insects or flying biomass in protected areas in Germany and shows that over the last 30 years we lost around 75% of the flying biomass. This is partially due to activities in agriculture, for example agrochemicals that have been used have some contribution to that. So the, the take home message here is we need to do something to kind of reduce these negative impacts. So, what are the challenges in some? We have a demand for a higher yield. At the same point in time, the amount of available arable land is limited. We still are using a quite substantial amount of agrochemicals, especially if you see that worldwide. There's negative side effects from herbicides, but also fertilizers and other things in our ecosystems. And also climate change will change the game, at least globally. And these are several challenges that agriculture, especially crop production, is facing today. And we set up a large project, or it's called a Cluster of Excellence in Germany, one of the largest funding instruments at the University of Bonn, together with the Research Center in Jülich, where we try to address this challenge. And the key question that we pose is, how can we reduce the negative impacts on the ecosystem, and at the same point in time, address the demand for a higher yield? This is kind of the central question, and we are around 170 people and some 40 faculty members trying to do research that works in this direction on kind of pushing this question more towards to an answer. And there are several things we can do, and let's have a simplified form. So on the one side, we need to increase the yield, that's what we said. What are the levers that we have in our hand in order to increase the yield? So we can push the potential yield, the actual yield up, and two levers, or two key levers in order to do this, are breeding and management on the field. So by improving breeding or speeding up breeding, we can generate, uh, for example, crops that generate a higher yield. And by targeted management on the field, we can actually give every plant the love that it needs. If we look to the other part, what are our impacts on our agroecosystem, a substantial amount depends on the inputs that we give into the ecosystem, so fertilizers, other agrochemicals. I mean, it's a simplified, form, a simplified presentation here, um, but if we are able to actually reduce those in inputs, that should be good at least. So what are ways for reducing those inputs? And also, supporting breeding or breeding support and management are two ways to achieve this, by, for example, breeding crops that are more resilient to certain stresses, or performing a very targeted intervention, spot spraying, for example, because this will reduce the amount of agrochemicals that are needed. So what are ways how we can address this? And 
in Finorop, this is the name of this project, we have three research areas we're trying to tackle this. The first one looks on developing digital technologies to address some of those tasks. So things such as sensing plays a role, robotics, machine learning, um, and that's the area where I'm at home, where my core research happens. But we have also other research areas. One targets an understanding of plant and soil. And a lot of people here belong to this area. Uli Schuhe, who is here, is also one of the members working in this area. A lot of the phenotyping activities happening in Rülich play a role in this research area. And the third one, trying to integrate that into environment and economy. So all the developments that we do will only be successful on a broad scale if they are economically viable, for example. And there are other things like simulating what would happen um, if we implement certain strategies. These are things which are integrated in this research area. But I will be talking about the first thing, the first area here, because that's the field where I'm at home. And you may ask yourself, what does a roboticist can help us with. So I'm a person who was building devices like this. So I've been working in factory automation. Um, one of my key research areas beside agricultural robotics are self-driving cars. We have built robots to explore and map the catacombs under Rome. We have built drones flying around doing mapping of critical infrastructure. So a lot of things where we build autonomous systems that are equipped with sensors, perceive the environment, and generate some form of action out of that. That's kind of the key things, if you, or the key ways how I could describe my research if I want to put it down with a single sentence. So how can these technologies, those robots, so things that we do, help in the context of crop production, for example? Okay, so there are two tasks that typically need to be done if we want to um, operate on our fields. The first thing we need to do, or the, the two things, monitoring and intervention, and the first thing which is important over here is that's kind of, this is a weird break on this presentation on the Windows, on the Mac it looks slightly different. So um, monitoring refers to the task of knowing what's going on on the field. So we need to assess the current status. And then intervention means doing the right thing. So based on the knowledge that we gained, perform operations, change the current status. And that's what we are looking into. I will start with the monitoring part and explain you a few examples of technologies that we have been developing in my group and the other groups in Bonn over the last years in order to move this monitoring and this perception part um, further, further forward. Um, the easiest way you can monitor a field from my perspective is using a UAV. So UAVs are small, they are cheap. This is a DJI Phantom 4. Videos that those of you who have larger kits may know. These are the things you use to film YouTube videos. And they're fairly cheap, $1,500, something around that. And they have a quite decent camera, and you can fly over your field and monitor your field. And then you can take the camera data in its simplest form and interpret this camera data. Of course, you can invest 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times more money into other drones, better sensors, more information. But a lot of the things you can do actually with fairly easy RGB sensing. But of course, depending on what your task is, you may want to install more um, expensive sensors on those platforms. Okay, and if you see this from a robotics perspective, we as robotics would say, hey, that's actually a bundle adjustment or SLAM problem joined with semantic scene interpretation. So SLAM stands for simultaneous localization mapping, and bundle adjustment is a technique from photogrammetry that we use to turn images into 3D models, into geometric models of the environment. And semantic scene interpretation means we want to assign a meaning to what we see. For example, if I see you here, I may say, okay, you're all humans in the environment. There are tables and chairs, not just geometry. Or I even identify things. Oh, there's Tony sitting over there. So these are semantic tasks where, where I, as a human, add labels to certain things that I see and put meaning to that. So on a crop field, this could be, oh, that's my crop, or that's a wheat plant or something like that. That could be the semantic label that I'm going to attach to that. And again, from the SLAM perspective, so this is an environment, or this is an example of um, a 3D model of the environment. This is a model built with a mobile robot with a laser scanner, so it's a colored point cloud. So you kind of see those small holes. This comes from the density of the laser scanner. And this is a quite precise geometric description of the field. And that's something that we're doing in robotics since actually a pretty long time, robotics since maybe 30, 30, or 40 years even. If you go to Geodesy, they do this since over 200 years. So Carl Friedrich Gauss was basically doing this when he was measuring the Kingdom of Hannover in a slightly different way, but a lot of the techniques he used are actually still the basis of what we are doing today as well. And we can do this also for using plants. We can do plant slam or slam on plants. So based on observations, based on laser scanner data or camera data, we can build 3D models of plants. And this is an example from a um, 3D laser scan taken of a small tomato plant, whatever, day 10 or 12, something along these lines of the emergence. Um, and then 
we can derive this information um, or we can use this point cloud data in order to derive information about that plant. And from the interpretation point of view, how that looks like on the field, we would get an input image. This is an example from a ground robot from a sugar beet field. And what we would like to have, we would like to label this image and assign to every pixel an information like, oh, this is a sugar beet plant, this is wheat, or this is background or soil. So this is the semantic interpretation part. And that's also something that we have been doing in robotics since quite a while, also computer vision, um, community kind of use techniques from machine learning and kind of 10 or 15 years ago gave a tremendous boost for the interpretation of image data. So especially computer vision has done a lot of contributions. What you do, you basically put in your image data here on that side, and then you have a magic neural network and it generates some output. So kind of this labeled image. And again, we have been using this in examples or applications such as autonomous driving or robots interacting with humans, where we take an input image here shown on the left-hand side and turn it into an interpreted image. On the top, there are different objects such as cars shown in blue, um, persons, pedestrians shown in red. So these are interpretations that an autonomous car needs in order to make its decisions. Or down here, it's just identifi uh, not identifying, but um, detecting humans in an image for robot doing interactions. And we have building those systems in order to do, um, to do real-time analysis of those systems. So especially my group doesn't really look into how can we do this in the most precise way as possible. We look a lot how we can do this really, really fast. So we can run that at 70 hertz or 50 hertz on a mobile platform, on a robot, and make decisions in near real-time. Even if the results are not perfect, these are typical results that we get even if we take a standard out-of-the-box approach for that. Okay, if we now take those systems and just retrain it on the field, then we will get an information. You basically see a neural network here learning during the learning process what is a crop and a wheat. And so green should turn into crop and red should turn into wheat plants. And you see how the data, how the network is actually trained with data and gets better and better over time during this learning process. And once we have that, we can identify that. Then we can take our drone, fly over the field and analyze the field. And then for every pixel in my photo taken off the ground, I can say, okay, this is, um, this is status of the field. So for example, you can see here a lot of these um, reddish pixels over here. These are, um, these are weeds. Um, here everything looks fine. Here maybe all the plants are a little bit slower, so there's maybe some slower growth. So we can derive information out of what we see on that field. The problem, if you want to do that, um, often is that the amount of training data that you have, so the data that is labeled like this, that you give those networks to train, um, is not that hugely available for these type of problems. If you would generate a system for detecting what's a human face, what's a cat, you can download thousands or millions of YouTube videos and train your system with those videos. It's much harder to do that on plants. So a lot of activities that we are doing is trying to use background knowledge, so things that we as humans know, feed them into those networks in order to speed up the learning process. And one of the things that we have done is um, we have been actually training or building classification systems for plants since a while. So we as humans have some ideas what are good features or good um, traits that we can use in order to make that decision. And the neural networks typically don't have that information. They just learn everything from scratch. If you have enough data, that's great, because they will learn even better features than those that we as humans have designed. But the problem is for that, you need a lot of data. And one of the ways, what we are trying to do, or, or did here in this work, was adding those features as additional input dimensions, those pre-compute those features that we used in the past, when we, in the, in the pre-deep learning area, used to classify plans, and give this the network as a starting point, and then you have it as a starting point, work with this, and improve yourself over time. And that leads to an approach where it's not a three-dimensional RGB input that you have here. It's in this case a 14-dimensional input image, which has additional feature maps computed to it that the network can use to kind of start off its learning process. And with this, it turns out with a tenth or even hundreds of the data, you achieve the same performance, so you can dramatically reduce your labeling efforts. In addition to that, what turns out to be the case, if you transfer a classifier from one environment to another environment, those systems typically generalize better to new scenes. So if we use our system and train it with data from Bonn, and then we ship it to our partners in Zurich and run the stuff in Zurich, it often doesn't perform really well, because the fields we trained on look different to the fields um, the system is then operating on. But if you give these networks, good features to start with as an initialization, they typically generate networks which generalize better to new and different environments because there's still some background knowledge in there, what features 
have been actually quite useful in the past, but still can improve over time. Then we can use this in order to um, transfer this also from different setups. So this again is a crop wheat classification example. Sorry, that's a bit dark. This was the input image. And then we can identify berries, for example, as well, with those systems just needing little training data and um, then analyze images even from other applications. Um, we can then fly over the field and do an analysis of, of breeding plots, for example. So these are sugar beet plots, and then we can go down and can actually even segment and identify every individual plant in there, find its stem location, and, and then do an analysis based on this data, just with fairly simple UAV flights. We can also take that further and do an other or different analysis tasks. So this is, for example, ear counting in, weeds, uh, in, in wheat. We just fly over the field and can identify all those years in a quite effective manner. Of course, only based on what's visible, but we can do this analysis kind of at large scale. So doing those interpretation tasks, once the classifiers are learned, happens in a fraction of a second. And so we can analyze large scale data with this. This also has led to one of the spin-offs from my lab, which is um, the Phenom Spec company, which basically provides those services. So you fly with your drone over your field, you have image data, and we provide um, a cloud-based labeling, uh, cloud-based image interpretation service, which derives several traits out of this data. And there are different applications for this, emergence counting, wheat mapping, also partially using this in wheat control, ear counting, different forms of breeding plot analysis. Basically, we target the, or we provide those traits that the customers want, and provide this in a cloud-based system where you can feed in your data and get those images back in an analyzed way. And one of the things I think we are pretty good in here is building general systems which learn really quick, so with small amounts of training data, you're actually able to get really good results out of the system. Well, that's one of the things where I think we, we perform actually quite good. So these are the semantic interpretation tasks that we are currently doing um, in our fields, but we can also look into geometry. And if you look into geometry, so these are kind of different days when a, a tomato plant has been scanned, or scanning days. Um, again, this is a lab environment, and we can build all 3D models actually fairly easily out of the box. But one of the interesting things is, can we also model the change over time? So can we turn the 3D model into a 4D model, where the fourth dimension, the time, plays um, an important role? And actually, automatically regist registering those plants with each other is actually a not too easy task, at least from a robotics point of view, because the object of interest actually changes its topology quite a bit. And so all of work, or it, it took us quite some time to get get good results here, one of the key tricks is to extract so-called skeleton information. That's something that's often used if you do um, analyze the movement of, of, of humans, because all the humans have more or less the same topology. With the plants, the topology changes, but we can build those topology and then try to build algorithms which try to find correspondences between those skeletons. And there are some probabilistic techniques which have been often used in order to try these data associations. In this case, this was a hidden Markov model which tries to find an as optimal as possible explanation what potential data associations could be. And once you have that, you can actually build graph structures and link those graph structures with each other in order to build a map. And that's something that, again, we as roboticists know how to do. We're doing this 20 or 30 years, so-called graph-based slam algorithms, doing mapping based on those graphs where a node in the graph is a spatial location, and the edges in those graphs are constraints or soft constraints that we can feed into optimization systems. So we have been using this, for example, in, in the context of autonomous driving, you know, to build maps of the environment. Here the robot drives through the environment at different points in time, and the robot creates so-called nodes in a hidden virtual graph, and then uses spatial relations to optimize these graphs and build maps of the environment. That's basically the way modern mapping systems today work in order to build, to build maps. And we can transfer this now to the plant registration problem. The only thing is the environment is not, um, is not rigid. We actually have deformations that are allowed. So basically build those graphs between those skeletons and then need to adjust the opti underlying optimization problem, adding different types of constraints in there, but can basically use the same toolboxes that we have been using for a couple of years in order to optimize those, plan those, those um, 40 models. This will then lead us to a 40 model. And what you see here, kind of the things which are flying from the left-hand side are actual observations that have been taken from the plant. And the red thing you see in the middle is basically an interpolation of that plant that is generated based on those observations. So although we have been scanning this plant, whatever, every third or fourth day, we can actually interpret how the plant may look like in between based on those observations and can model the growth also at points in time where we don't have them. 
This allows us then to track, for example, the development of individual organs over time. You can see then how new organs emerge and how their growth changes over time. And this is something that we can do quite effectively in those setups. The problem with this is this was all lab data. So we took a plant in a lab environment, took a high-precision high laser scan and actually built maps from those plants. This becomes more tricky if you move from the lab to the field, but that's something that we are interested in, in kind of getting that out of controlled environments into the natural environments. And work we've been doing here, what we said, I said we use a lot of drones and taking images of data, and if you use kind of really good mapping systems from, um, from image data, you will actually get data like this. So this is just a photo, and this is a 3D model of a top-down view, but if you go closer, you can actually see a couple of holes because not everything has been seen from those objects. And um, if you then zoom further in, you will see that there are some are holes, sometimes parts of the leaves are not perfectly reconstructed, and it's actually quite hard to use this point cloud data to derive traits automatically out of this kind of data with such a lot of holes. And one of the ideas here is actually going back in computer vision using some techniques that have been actually pretty old, is using a template-based approach. So we provide kind of a template leaf and then try to deform this template leaf in order to fit it to the actual leaves. And by minimizing the distance between the observations and what this kind of synthetic leaf looks like, we can actually deform it and get a pretty good reconstruction, getting rid of all those holes and also dealing with, with occlusions really well. So if you we then zoom in, so this is an example of the actual observation data, and you basically can see such one of those triangle meshes, one of those surface meshes, which are fitted to, those, um, to this observation data. And the interesting things, which comes into the game, that we can derive certain traits on our templates. So this was a very simplistic leaf template, where we can now define certain properties on this template in order to derive certain parameters like whatever, stem lengths, curvature, and things like this. And then we take this template, deform the template to the observation, and given that we have this um, parametric representation through the template, we can actually derive those traits in a really easy manner. And this was one of the ways how we can actually go from this type of data where you have a lot of holes and missing parts into generating templates and then derive those traits automatically out of the template, which was one of the key things um, that we have done in order to take that data from the controlled lab environment where a human operator was making sure he or she scanned every part of that plant into a setup where this is not the case anymore. And the interesting thing is we can even go a step further and also guess what we can't see. So that is currently um, a work that will be presented next week in Japan at the IROS conference, where we look into data and trying to infer what we don't see. So this is one of the robots operating in the, in the greenhouses in Bonn, um, equipped with a fairly low-budget um, RGBD camera, those Intel RealSense cameras, observing fruit, so you get data points which look like this and we can extract them semantic, with semantic segmentation, everything looks fine, but if you look to the data itself, it basically looks like this, of a sweet pepper. Well, the question is, how does that sweet pepper actually look like? And the interesting thing is now what we can do is we can use learning approaches and combine them with these geometric mapping systems in order to guess what we can't see. So we can hallucinate a model that fits well to the observation built so far and have a sweet pepper which actually looks like this. May not be the perfect one, but maybe pretty close and typically sufficient to plan, for example, grasping actions or active perception actions, where to look to make sure I complete actually the view of that. How can we do that? How does that work? How can we actually achieve that guessing, which we as humans can do really well, but it's actually not too trivial for a computer. So what we did here, we again went to our lab environment and um, built 3D models of different sweet peppers and also scanned them with this RGB cam RGBD camera, with this cheap camera. So we have the high-resolution model and the low-resolution models. And then we try to build a scene completion approach, which tries to add, or which tries to infer from this data to what the data should actually look like. And just kind of the, the key trick that we used in here that works is these networks typically have an encoder part and decoder part. The encoder part takes the raw input data and turns it into some intermediate representation, and then the decoder turns this intermediate representation or features or advanced features into the things we actually would like to know. And we started here feeding point clouds, complete point clouds, with a decoder and turn it into what we call a signed distance field, which is one way how you can represent surfaces um, in, in computers quite effectively. And we can train this system, train this decoder, and then we actually freeze this decoder, we take it out of the optimization problem, and then train only an encoder which turns the 
partial view into a, an intermediate representation that is hopefully able then to complete our model. And with some optimizations, we can actually do this, and they actually get pretty good results. So these are individual views, or three partial 3D models that we can see here, and these are the, with the semantic segmentation, or now it's an instance segmentation system, so finding all the different instances, and running then the completion model, and then you can see how the different um, predictions actually look like. They are far from perfect. There's the first work in this direction from the lab, but it's one way where you can then use this data to um, plan further actions like harvesting actions or maybe yield predictions. So yield predictions are typically better if you have these things, even if the shape is not perfect, compared to if you don't know what's actually going on, how much you have seen from that object under investigation. With this, I think I'm moving on from the monitoring to the intervention side, so from knowing what's going on to doing the right thing. Okay, so, and I want to start with weed control because the thing I best know with, I've been working with this for quite a while. What are approaches to weed control? On the one side, you can actually spray your field, or you can take, for example, a manual weeding action if you want to kind of avoid the agrochemicals. And the question is now, how, does it, how would it look like if you would build a robot which does this task? So these have been works we have been starting around 2014 in a European project executed together with ETH Zurich, with Roland Siegbart's group, um, building a system that can perceive what's going on on the field and then do weeding actions on that field. And it basically uses, at the first step, these classification or semantic segmentation systems I was talking before. So you get your input image, you have this magic neural network, which actually turns the image into this type of interpreted scene. And if you can do this in real time or near real time, then the next thing is we actually want to get rid of those rat plants over here. How can we actually get rid of them? Once we detect them, which actions can we execute to kill them? One could be spraying, so kind of selectively spray individual plants. I could also use things like mechanical weeding techniques in order to get rid of those plants, or other ways on how to do that. So this was kind of the, the first um, experiments that we have been running on, a, on our test farm, Klein Altendorf, next to Bonn, where the system was driving over the field, interpreting what's going, and then had to, in the beginning a simple or very simple spraying unit, which was basically spraying on all those red spots that kind of pop up here. And that's one way how you can do this. If you want to do mechanical weeding, you typically need not to find only which pixels belong to um, the weed plant. You also want to identify, for example, where's the stem, because it's much better to stamp away the stem or kill the, kill the plant at the stem location rather than just um, destroying an individual leaf, for example. And this has led to a system developed also in this project that was done by Bosch, which is basically a glorified Bosch nail gun, which drives over the ground and basically nails um, weeds into the ground. So this is a kind of a slow-mo video, how this kind of glorified nail gun, how I used to call it, goes over the field, the vision system detects this and basically stamps the plant away. That was actually pretty cool, something you can do completely free of, um, of chemical use, but it actually turned out the system was not really that effective, and especially the thing was not very robust, so it broke after a few days of operation. So even with the people from Bosch who know how to do nail guns, you were not really successful in actually building a cool system which, which, which can do this in an intelligent way. Uh, that was a bit disappointing, but then we kind of looked further, what else can we do? Um, and so it also turns out that some of the, the objects you can't really um, stamp away, like grass weeds, doesn't really work well, so we then had a system which could spraying and stamping, but again, the stamper wasn't really great, so we then looked for alternatives. And that started, I think, in 2017 or 18. A guy came to my lab, Julio Pastrana, which says, I want to do this with lasers. So I want to take a laser, a high-power laser, and burn away the weeds um, there. And this was kind of the first experiment. We got it running for the first time. I think it was a six-watt laser at that point, directing it in a lab environment onto a single plant and kind of burning it away. So you can see the, the, the stem is burned over here, and then this thing would hopefully die. But what you could also see, it took actually a pretty long time to do that. So these the first experiments, also getting this approved at university was a mess with getting explosion safe rooms and laser people, it was, was kind of a mess. So we thought, okay, this, this doesn't work at the university, let's found a company and try to do that in a company. And this is the company Escada Technologies in Berlin, funded in 2019. Um, which um, tries to do that. And this year we have been actually really successful for the first time. We have been running this as a customer at a customer at um, Morningstar Company in the US for, on tomato fields for ketchup production. And this is how the system works right now. So you can drive over the field, you see kind of sparks potting up. This is basically a laser 
driving off the field and burning um, the, the weeds away. And this is currently works at, so the speed is not as fast as it should be, this kind of four kilometers per hour or something uh, along these lines, and there are sort of certain things which are still critical, like um, you, have to, you have to have this shielding thing for safety reasons when people are in the, uh, nearby, and um, it's, it's not everything solved, but it actually works really reliable, and also Morningstar Company have been really happy about the outcomes, and now ordered several of those systems um, to be running, at least on the test fields, where they can do that. And that was really nice to actually see those things that you develop in the lab and first think, oh, this, this will never going to work. There are so many issues actually turning this into one of those products. Okay, so what are the challenges in there? What are things which we haven't solved yet? Um, from the laser point of view, there are still a lot of safety issues. These are more regulation things. We make, make sure this stuff doesn't burn if everything is super dry. What to do if people are in the surroundings? So a lot of things with whatever... German TÜV won't be very happy about that. Um, and there's still work to do, but from a technical perspective, we're actually coming closer to really to a working solution. Um, one of the things which um, is still a challenge from the perception point of view, and there's something that we are working uh, in my group quite a bit as well, is kind of robustifying the perception system under strongly varying field conditions. So these are examples, data recorded in Bonn, um, in Renningen near Stuttgart, and at ETH Zurich, um, having those systems and the, the data that we get from those different fields looks very different. Partially different cameras or different robots used, um, different field conditions, different calibrations of those systems, um, different weeds. It's actually pretty hard to build one system and apply it in different sites. Um, so one of the things that we have been investigating is trying to avoid this bad generalization from one field to another field. So if you train on a field which looks like this, like field A, and you apply the system on field B, you see some crops are correctly classified, others are wrongly classified, and that's what you want to like to avoid. So you have what we call a low generalization performance. And this always happens if the image is taken in your target or in your, in your, in your source domain or your, your training environment look different to those images that you experience when you actually run that system on the real side. So if everything is similar as in the training, everything is good, you're, you're happy. If you take whatever your field, you tie one, one crop row you use for training and then test it on the others, everything will be easy because the thing will look pretty similar. If you use one field in year one and a field in a different city or different country in another year, that will be a big mess. So if you do this, um, the, the, your target, your source domain images may look like this, and the target domain Sorry, it's hard to see on the projector, I'm afraid. Um, they look actually pretty different. Then your classification system will be a complete mess. You've, nothing useful will come out of that if you do that. And so what we would like to have, we would like to change that so that it's actually in the target domain, we actually get the correct classification. So these grass weeds here are correctly identified. That's actually the correct result. So how can we change that? How can we make this source domain and target domain match better with each other. And that's kind of still a big challenge that we have in here. And what we can do is, is a so-called style transfer. And that's something, a technique that you know already, or at least your kids know for sure. If you take your mobile phone out and you make a picture of whatever the person sitting next to you, and you have some creative filters in your phone, okay, you can say, make this image look like a Van Gogh painting. And your phone will turn that into a painting, which may not be a perfect Van Gogh painting, but you, you can get that. The style is kind of the same. And we can use this kind of style transfer approaches also in these things by saying, okay, let's take some, some images from the source domain, from the target domain, and make sure we don't need any labels for that. I'm not saying it's exactly the same thing. It's just kind of the style that we want to copy, not the exact content. And then we can do a style transfer and take the target domain image, so the thing which looks different, make this magic transfer, and suddenly it looks like an image from the source domain. So this is the image from the target domain, this is a training domain, this is a style transferred one. So now this image, which is the same content, is still the same content, but it looks like an image which comes from here. And this allows you to take the step forward and solve not all, but some of the issues in this, um, in, in this generalization performance that if you then use your classifier in your test field B, which looks different, the system can actually learn that and make the transition. Again, that's one thing, we are still not fully there yet. There are still a lot of challenges if you change your setup completely, if you want to transfer from drones to ground vehicles, um, different conditions. There's still a lot of work which needs to be done. This was just kind of one example how you can do that. Other approaches look more into the area of what we call unsupervised learning, where we try to learn representations without having humans label all those images, and then only do kind of a fine-tuning later on with labels. So different ways, we still do not know which way is the best one, but 
we can actually make steps from my point of view in the right direction. And these are activities that we are currently doing um, in my lab in Bonn. Okay, this brings me to the end of my presentation, what I presented here so far in terms of management. This was just kind of these approaches to chemical-free weeding. It's just the first step. There are a lot of other things you can do. If you think about crop protection, plant diseases, a lot of things are much harder in this domain. So if you use your standard RGB camera, a lot of things you see only if it's already too late. So you want to use different spectral bands in order to do still an early detection of, um, of diseases, for example, which again poses a lot of challenges in the field if you have uncontrolled lighting conditions. So there's still a lot of work which needs to be done and kind of can get more and more, it can just get harder. There's still a lot of problems down the line that we need to tackle, but for some of the problems, we actually have already pretty good solutions available by today. With this, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. I hope I have shown you a few examples how robotics technology or digital technologies can be actually interesting for monitoring and intervention tasks and have the potential to change some of the aspects in agriculture or crop production. Still, these are early steps, we are not there yet, and there are still a lot of specific challenges for the crop production domain, which are different from the general computer vision problem, and it's actually not too easy to kind of motivate people from a general domain to actually work on your specific problem domain. Why is this the case? Because if you do that on your own, as in a small computer science lab, for example, um, people typically download their data sets, work on their data sets, sometimes they record data on their own, but you typically need a lot of background knowledge in order to make those systems perform really well. So, it was a long process for me, starting to talk to the people from um, the institutes in, in agriculture, um, but this is now something which I'm doing since 2014-15 when I got appointed in Bonn, something like this, and it did to a very fruitful interaction with a lot of approaches where you need some technical expertise from a computer scientist or engineer, but also knowledge from the actual application where you want to apply your problems. And I think you need both sides in order to do, do that well, and different competences that you need to actually bring together. The two application areas where I think are most promising, please correct me if I'm wrong, my view is very limited, but those which I think make sense are breeding support, especially the monitoring things are really helpful here. You need less of the action application um, problems in here, which makes a lot of problems easier. Um, but also management on the field is something I'm interested in, where you need this tight coupling of perception and action. And with this, I would say thank you very much for your attention, and I would like to acknowledge the work at the University of Bonn happening, Research Center ULIC, which has led to FINOROP, and of course the DFG for very generous support that we still have until 2000, end of 2025, and hopefully for another seven years until 2033, if everything works well. With this, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you very much, Cyril. Some nice ideas in there. Are there any questions? Do we have sure, someone else has a mic? Yeah, thanks. Uh, you said that it was still problematic to translate uh, the problem from field A to field B. Yep. Is that because in field B there are other weeds and uh, other plants, or is it because the environmental conditions are different and your program is not recognizing that well, or is there another player? Uh... So there are several things which play a role. The first thing is the weed. Weeds were different weeds on the, on the field. Um, the soil conditions look very, sim very different. Um, we had the same robot, the same cameras, but not the exactly the same system in the beginning. So with the two platforms which were built identical, but potential different calibration aspects uh, which played a role. Um, so these were the, the challenges we started with. By now we are really looking into also substantially different appearances. So going from UAVs to ground vehicles on different fields. And so we have made really big steps in this generalization performance. Um, I would say really different cameras, different soil conditions, um, different weeds, and also over the years, even if it's the same field over different years, things look very different. Um, so these were the main parameters that we experienced um, in, in over the last years. Right, but the different years will still come, I mean, new years will always be different from past years? Um, is if this is always now? the same with the question, but the, the interesting thing is if you can do this, this style transfer without labels, that's kind of the key thing. You just need images from a field without needing to label it, and then you can do the style transfer, and that's the attractive thing. You just need to basically do one flight of the field without any manual work work, which can be basically automated, and then the style transfer can be learned, you can translate the images and it really works well. So the key thing in this style transfer is that it basically works without labels or just with very little labels. Okay, so there's a question behind you. W 
what is the, con uh, the computational effort to really turn, let's say, uh, all your RGB or whatever data from a field into then such a model that you can really use to? Okay, so we have distinguished two things here. The first thing is what needs to run on those platforms and what needs to run in the background to do the learning task. So on the UAVs, we typically don't do the interpretation on the UAV while flying because um, we don't need that. We just need to collect the data and it's totally fine to process it offline because we don't need a closed loop interaction. Um, so therefore, we don't have any expensive or computationally expensive stuff on the, on the drones. On the ground vehicle, that's different. We typically use here standard GPUs. So in the examples you have shown here, this was a standard NVIDIA GPU at that time, whatever, maybe a 1080, which was the best thing you could get five years back. Um, today, you can actually get embedded platforms where you can do this, maybe not at 50 hertz, but at 20 hertz for sure, even with embedded GPUs. And um, on most of the smaller robots that we have by now today, we don't even have very expensive GPUs on them anymore. These are typically um, the embedded GPUs, or sometimes for development purposes, we still have one single NVIDIA GPU on it. It's somewhat different on the back end, where you do the learning task. We collect the data, bring it to the lab, and do the, do the learning and adaptations. Here we again use NVIDIA GPUs. We typically have machines with four to eight GPUs in there, which do the, do the heavy lifting. It takes maybe a day to retrain your classifier. It, it really depends on your problem. But we are not talking about weeks, or, or in this time span, we are talking with whatever, let's say, 30,000 euro investment in compute. It's less than a day to do, to do adaptations. Um, but still, that's something which um, you can work on. Speeding up the offline processes has not been really our focus, um, because we typically have that compute available. Um, but we want to make sure that the stuff we need to run on robots is fast enough to run at at least camera frame rate in order to react immediately to what's going on. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, to keep to time, we have to call a, an end to it there. But I'm sure you'll all join me in thanking Cyril once again. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much.